and welcome to the latest video following the restoration of our 1924 Fowler narrow gauge locomotive. This is a photograph of how we found the locomotive, how it was before we started. And this is about the front buffer beam to start us off with, with this week's video. Looking at the plan view, looking down on the frames from the top, you can see at the front that the main frames are fastened to the buffer beam with this angle iron. There's four of them. One, two, and then three, four at the other side. And forgetting all the buffer draw gear, just looking at the buffer beam itself, when we look back at the original photograph, you can see that there's rusty, horrible nuts and bolts and welds and things that were holding it all together. Um, and from the original works photo, you can see that they should have been rivet heads. Originally, it was all riveted together. So this is Ian and Dave working on the actual buffer beam and the, the angle irons to open out the holes and to get them all back in the right place so that we can start putting them back together with rivets and rivet-headed bolts, which we'll cover later in the video. You may remember from a previous video that the front of the main frames was bent and we chopped it off and we put on a brand new section. So the holes through the frames are actually brand new holes but the angle line has all been pressed back square um, from the slightly bent shape that it was when it all first arrived, has, as has the buffer beam. Um, and nothing really matched where it should have been, so we've had to sort of make the holes in the frames to match the new positions that the angle line and the buffer beam had. And the same thing to a certain extent with the buffer beam as well. The rivets that we're using um, obviously needed rivet dollies to be able to press them into shape. Um, we made the rivet dollies back up in the workshop and this is showing the rivets fitting in there. Um, obviously one sits on the bottom to provide support to the existing head and then the second sits on the top and is obviously squashed by the 50 ton press. You have to heat up the rivet to a really high temperature in order to make it malleable enough to squash and this is the process in action. Um, you can see the press head pushing down on the top dolly and when it goes up, you'll see that there is our first rivet. That's a rivet everybody. <laughs> Happy team there that the first attempt actually worked. So this is a closer look at the actual process. This is heating up the shaft of the rivet itself. You can see it's glowing really hot. And as I pull back with the camera, you can see that the press is coming down. At the last minute, we take away the blowtorch and then you'll see the process happen if we get close in. There we go, squash down, keep the pressure on for a little while. Actually took the press up to about 35 tonnes. And then as it pulls away, the dolly just dropped off the end of the press there and Dave's going to put his hand in and lift it out. But you'll be able to see that the rivet head's nicely formed when we get in closer quite successful really they're not only quite pretty rivets but they're nipped up really tight so that's those angle irons really firmly fastened down onto the buffer beam they're not going to move again in an ideal world we'd have used a forge to heat up the rivets before putting them in pick them up with tongs out of the forge and then popped them through the holes before we squashed them with the rivet press but we, we don't have a forge handy so this was the next best way of achieving the same result and and it looks really pretty too quite pleased with that Fastening the whole assembly now onto the main frames, um, we didn't want to rivet these on. We want it to look like rivets, but we want it to be removable. Um, practically as well, riveting through the actual frames would have been really quite difficult. We couldn't have got it up on its end to put it in the press, um, and it would have been quite difficult to support the dolly. So this is looking in the CNC lathe that we've got at Steam Workshop, and we are machining specially rivet-headed bolts. Um, to use in this position so it's exactly the same from the outside with the rivet head but actually behind the scenes it's a bolt where we're going to be able to put a washer and a nut on the end so that if we do ever need to take the buffer beam off we can. The actual rivet head itself was created manually as you can see here John using the, the spherical cutter tool in the lathe. Um, it pivots around a point which you line up with the center of the um, rivet headed bolt and then you can machine off the right amount to make it the same diameter and, and curvature as the rivets in the buffer beam itself. Quite a satisfying little process to watch that. Back to the fitting of the main frames um, into those angle irons that were riveted onto the buffer beam. We had to use the big drill to get through because we were creating the holes essentially from scratch into the new plate. Um, but once they were there, we were able to put the new fitted rivet headed bolts through those holes. It's all held upon the crane there and clamped together in place. 
But with the new bolts fitted and the nuts on the back, you can see that from the outside, it looks exactly like that works photograph. And from the front, it now looks like it would have looked originally with rivets instead of mismatched rusty old bolts and nuts. Moving further down the frame, we repeated the same process. This is with the tank support brackets. There are four of them in total. Again, they were fastened on with an array of old, different mismatched nuts and bolts, um, having obviously been removed at some point in the Loco's working life. Um, but again, we've chosen to fit them with rivet-headed bolts, again, made in the same way, so that they look like the works photograph um, from the outside. But if we ever need to take them off again, we can, we can undo the nuts from the back and take them off. Bit of a cheat, but quite a sensible one, I think, um, which allows us a little bit of freedom of choice as the low code's life progresses once we're using it in, in, in actual service. Moving on to the horn guides, which you can see here are the two cast brackets either side of the axle box, which slides up and down between them. And then there's a horn keep that goes across the bottom. Originally, the horn guides were bolted on with um, eight nuts and bolts. You can see here from the works photograph, the bolt heads from the outside. Um, by the time it had gone through Tully Sugar Mill, they've replaced them with these sort of mismatched and fairly clumsy looking fitted bolts from the inside with double nutted uh, over length bolts on the outside. This is before we started taking it apart. Um, so back to our workshop, we've made some more fitted bolts in the CNC lathe and this is machining off one flat side in the rotary table on the bridge port. Um, we're going with the Tully method where we're fitting them from the inside, but they're all gonna look the same. And you can see here, Jenny fitting one of the new bolts with some of the old ones still in place to hold everything square. Um, they're a really tight fit through. And from the outside, you can see that they're much neater with just one washer and one single nut to hold them in place than the scruffy ones that are still in there holding it in place from the top. We needed to make sure that the horn guides were firmly fastened on as we wanted them to be um, before we grind the faces flat so that we can make the axle boxes fit in exactly the right place. And this was the process we had to do before we can do that in the next stage. Um, you can see they look a lot neater from both the inside and the outside here with the horn keep ones fitted as well. All the same, once they've got a coat of black paint over them, they'll look great and red paint over the inside, they'll look as good as new. So this is the smoke box saddle. Um, being lifted into place. It's the big casting that supports the um, smoke box at the front. Um, it's also a frame stretcher, so it holds the frames square and gives them strength. And as you can see, there's the oval holes and the round hole in the side that lets the main steam pipe come through the oval hole and then the exhaust steam pipe to go up the blast pipe and ultimately the chimney is the round hole there. As you'd imagine, you it's quite a tight day? fit in there, so it had to be jiggled down into place, and this is its final resting place, still supported by the crane. Um, it was fitted bolts that we made to fasten it all back together again, uh, made in exactly the same way, and you can see here we're using the rotary table to um, cut the six um, hexagon faces to make proper bolts. They're all fitted to machine to quite a tight tolerance, so they have to be driven home with a hammer when we get the whole thing together. The cylinder, of course, has to go on at this point. It's not quite the final fitting of the cylinder um, because we've got a little bit of work to do on this face particularly. You can see it's a slight cone shape where an olive gets clamped between the main steam pipe to hold the main steam pressure in there and the face isn't quite a good enough finish yet we need to get that on the milling machine and reface it um, but we need to clamp the cylinder on at this point so that we can clock up the bore of the cylinder and line that up with the horn guides that you saw fitted earlier so that we can make sure that they're perpendicular to each other so that the horn guides can be finished off nice and square and true so that when we then fit the axles, ultimately, they also run true and in line with the frames. The, uh, the more eagle-eyed amongst you may notice a couple of continuity errors here. The, the frames in this shot are the right way up, um, and in a couple of following shots, they're upside down, and one of them, even the front buffer beam's missing, because we had the, uh, the cylinders off and on a couple of times to make sure that they fitted correctly. You can see the, the bolts have to be driven home quite firmly because they're a tolerance to fit. And in this shot, looking from the underneath, you can see that this row doesn't go through the smoke box saddle. It just goes straight through the frames and directly into the cylinder block itself. So this row of bolts was slightly shorter than the ones that had to pass through the casting of the smoke box saddle first. 
that's pretty much the end of this video. Special thanks this time for watching go to our youngest viewer, Connor Duncan, who's five. Um, Connor's dad, Jamie, tells us that he looks forward to watching these videos. Um, so I'm sorry it's taken me so long to upload this one. And even at five, I've seen Connor drive steam engines brilliantly. So we're going to make you a special box so that you can reach the regulator on this one when it's finally finished for you to have a go. Um, thanks ever so much to everybody else for watching as well. Um, it's starting to look satisfying now. We're starting to get some of the big components back on. Hopefully not long now before the axle boxes and wheels go back in and then we can really see the progress. Thanks again. Be back soon with more.